You're on. So we did treat the uh, yeah. things that we discussed in the previous film, and we restored motion in the fibula. I can now take up slack in that structure, and I can spring it. And in terms of springing it posteriorly, the same thing is true. Uh, mobilize the cuboid. And now when I clasp the cuboid, it's very easy to glide it up and down. You can see the movement goes through the whole body. It's no longer stuck. Same thing with the heel. Motion restored very easily there. And so now when I take it to end range, I can overpressure it that way. I can twist it this way, overpressure it. So that motion was restored. Um, the effect that it had on her body was that after this was corrected, the thoracic segment was no longer twisted. Uh, T2 was no longer twisted to the right. Um, it self-released. Earlier I said that the second rib was stuck, but what I actually found was that the third rib was very prominent and it was actually stuck. So it permutated a little bit. Now, uh, the sacrum was still stuck, but if you would kindly get in that same position, most of the child's yoga pose, um, I taught her how to correct it herself. She had a left-on-left -left sacral torsion, and the lower quadrant was stuck and prominent, and I taught her how to treat it. She treated it herself, and now it's no longer prominent. I can take up the slack, and you can see that I can then spring it, and the force goes through it, and now I'm done with the spring test. It's actually called um, springing with awareness. That's what we describe my, my method of springing as. And now I'm going to let go of having taken up the slack. Now after that, I screened the sacrum, I screened the ilia. The ilium on both sides move normally in all directions. And I screened L5 all the way up to about T10. No, no restrictions there. I checked ribs on both sides. The reason I did that is that this prominence is still there, albeit not quite as much. So I mentioned that to her, and she then told me um, that in, in your youth, uh, they said you had a, a mild scoliosis? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I try and get those out in the history screening, which I did earlier, and that one escaped me. I didn't ask the right question to elicit that. So then we came up here. And she was on her stomach, and then I restored mobility in that third rib. I leaned on it in the appropriate angle for the appropriate length of time. After that, it had good anterior-posterior mobility, good rotational mobility, but it was stuck superiorly. So then I restored inferior glide. So then we cleared this area. There's no rotational patterns. So now I'm able to look deeper and look for a symmetrical restriction. Okay? If you could line your stomach, please. Um, it's more obvious when she's lying prone in a symmetrical position, arms on both sides. And I palpated between the vertebrae and I said, you know what? T2 feels like it's a little bit more anterior. And of course, T1 is always more prominent. But if you look at the relationship between the spinous process of 2 and 3, 2 looks very deep. So I came and I, I did the, uh, the spring testing. And I came up to two, I'm on three right now, and now I'm on two and I can't take up the slack. I'm putting the same force, I'm doubling the force, and I cannot take up the slack, so there's no way that I could spring it. I'm trying to balance it, and now I come up to T1, and my comment on T1 is that's more mobility than I would expect for your age, body type, occupation, etc. So T1 is like a little bit hypermobile, but it has to be because T2 doesn't move. Now, I would have expected that if T2 is forward, I would expect that, that the transverse processes would glide the ribs forward and make them rather hypomobile. So I'm springing the ribs here, and they have a little bit of tightness to them, yet I can get some motion in there, but they have, they have a distinct endpoint. At that endpoint, I really can't spring them. But if I come down here on this rib, um, it's, it's also somewhat tight. I think that if we free up this vertebrae, I think these, the, the tightness in these ribs is going to free up also. Um, I can get a little bit of motion in that, in that second rib, you know, but a, a distinct end point. If I come to number one rib, there's only one place where you'll find it, right there, and no, number one rib springs nicely.
So if you lie on your back, I always evaluate the T-spine, the upper T-spine, by testing movements in the ribs in the front and in the sternum. Can you lie on your back? And we'd already done that. We had already um, quickly springed the sternum, but I wasn't, I stopped at the manubrium, but now that we know what she has in the back, I came, I screened the clavicles. Um, the sternum moved quite nicely throughout, but when you come up to the manubrium, this is the manubo, <laughs> the junction of the manubrium and the sternum. Okay, when we come right here, bam, it's stuck. I cannot push that backwards at all. It's not compliant. Furthermore, the manubrium is supposed to curve back. So the, the top of the body of the sternum is supposed to be more forward. In this example, the manubrium is almost, almost forward of the uh, body of the sternum. So that further supports my belief that T2 is stuck forward. And so if we come on there, you can see that we can't take up the slack, we can't spring it. I'm going to come up on the, well now I'm on clavicles, so yes, you can spring the clavicles. Um, come off to the ribs here in the front. Okay, so cartilage is here, fibro cartilage here, and then there's the sternum, the manubrium. Fibro cartilage is here and bone is out here. So if we come out laterally and start springing the bone, okay, we have movement here. Okay, and we come on to number two. What do you feel, Catherine? Mm. This doesn't move. That's mm -hmm. what I feel. Okay, can you feel a difference between this force mm -hmm. and how your body accepts it and this force? A bit, yeah. Was it, what feels different? Well, this one's more springy. This is tight. Yeah, this one I just can't spring at all. So my treatment now is going to be to restore um, anterior glide is a part of extension, okay? And what I'm going to do is try to restore flexion and posterior glide. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flex her neck right up to that segment until I cannot open that segment anymore. I'm talking about T1 to T2 because I'm working from above downward, okay? So when I can't flex her anymore, I don't want to flex below that level. Okay, so I might, I might put a towel roll to block motion at three and below, or at least block four and below. And I'm going to come and I'm going to lean on the manubrium at a specific angle to parallel my forces in trying to distract, you can relax, mm -hmm. distract T1. I'm going to do traction on her head. I'm going to need some help. I need three hands. Okay, four hands, five. You know, so I'm going to do traction to gap that joint and then I'm going to glide the manubrium. It'll carry the ribs posteriorly at the appropriate angle and do traction. It'll be flexed to open up that joint and we'll maintain that for about two minutes. And I predict that we're going to restore normal mo mobility there and that we will restore no mo normal mobility at rib number two on both sides a normal PA at T1, but will reduce the hypermobility at T1 vertebrae per PA spring test. Uh, furthermore, there will probably be a gross motion difference. I would predict to you, and I haven't screened it yet, but we'll look at, we will look at flexion and extension of her neck, and then we'll see if that changes. But we'll stop right now. Thank you.